Hi, everyone. Welcome to Academics of PA. I'm Josie Schaefer, and I'm here with Bruce McDonald. Hey, Josie. How's it going? I'm good. How are you? It's a glorious Tuesday, so I can't complain. No, it's a Wednesday. Never mind. <laughs> I just <laughs> it's lost sunny today. and nice here. I actually have an exciting evening planned. Do you want to know? Ooh, sure. I, I am going to the Chuck Hagel Forum featuring John Kerry. Huh. Yeah, and it's in a small kinda... auditorium, and the dean gave me his honored guest seat, so I am going to be right up front, I assume. I don't know where an honored guest seat is. Never been to one. Well, I would like to introduce our guest today. We have Al Roberts, who is a professor of public policy at the University of Massachusetts Amherst and director of the School of Public Policy and the Department of Political Science. Welcome, Al. Hi. Nice to be Hi. with you. Thanks. Thanks for being here. We tried to schedule you a little bit ago, and we're happy to finally have you and talk about some of the very cool things you're doing. I guess we'll start. Why don't you tell us how you came to this field? Well, I've always been interested in uh, government and politics uh, from when I was a very small kid. And uh, I started off studying political science or political studies, as we called it, at Queen's University in Canada. And um, did two years of that and decided that was too abstruse for me. So I went to law school and did a law degree at University of Toronto. And, and I did a couple of years of that and realized that was just way too in the weeds for me. Um, and so uh, uh, one of my faculty, uh, uh, one of my professors uh, suggested I uh, apply to the Kennedy School for an MPP. So I humored him and got in and uh, just decided I loved doing public policy. So that's what I ended up doing. Well, so humor us. Uh, how was the Kennedy School? What'd you learn there? What'd you do? <laughs> uh, it was interesting. Um, they had a, it was the um, mid 80s. Uh, they, the public policy field was still relatively young. Um, they had um, decided they wanted to basically chuck out everything public administration had done. The Kennedy School actually used to be the Litauer School of Public Administration. It was renamed in the late 1960s, and they basically chucked out all of the old um, uh, curriculum. And uh, the new curriculum was very much dominated by uh, people who did uh, uh, economics or operations research, a very quantitative approach to the field. And so even when I was there, I was actually quite frustrated by... Uh, their omission of three things. Uh, they were, uh, there was no uh, content relating to law in the program. And I took, I did not understand how you could train people for senior positions or advisory positions in government without giving them some rudimentary uh, knowledge of uh, law and the rule of law. Uh, there was, uh, basically no attention to the, the existing literature on problems of administration. Um, and uh, the literature on politics, so sort of grand politics in particular, I thought could have been developed as well. So uh, I, I actually, I went through the program. I actually took a break after the MPP because I was ambivalent about the way that they approached public policy, but I eventually went back and did my PhD in public policy there too. So, so much to unpack there. Really interesting. Uh, I would say I have a rudimentary understanding of the law. <laughs> and so I should probably not have my job. Uh, and I probably would get myself in a lot less trouble if I did. So talk about how um, your legal experience or law school helped you to think, come to know and understand the importance of the rule of law and then how that's been integrated into some of your work. Well, I think uh, just a couple of points that, you know, if you're training, preparing people for public service, they need to understand what the rule of law is. They need to know something about the, basics of, uh, of uh, the constitution of the jurisdiction they happen to be in. Um, they need to know a little bit about administrative law. They don't need, um, you know, they don't need a law degree, but they need uh, at least a, a chunk of a course that says, 
you know, you need to understand these are the parameters. Even if you're doing public policy analysis, you need to know that because one of the things you should be doing when you're doing a policy analysis exercise is an analysis of legal risks, which is you've got a range of policy options. Um, what are the dangers that some uh, group out there is going to challenge the legality of what you're proposing to do? How do you gauge legal risks? So uh, even if you're doing straight up policy analysis, um, you, you need to know something about uh, law. And having said that, I've now forgotten what the rest of the question was. It's okay, me too. No, that's actually, <laughs> I think that's really interesting. Uh, and I don't, I can't think of anyone we've talked to here that really uh, brings that perspective. Um, I think everyone, right, would say, oh, well, we have a rule of law class on everything. You know, it, there's a rule of law as a topic in, you know, every class, but is it, is it a real focus? Do we really... Um, do, you know, have I ever thought to analyze something from the from a legal perspective? Absolutely not. Well, you know, I mean, so the it, it, I believe I'm right in saying that if you look at the NASPA standards on accreditation, uh, you won't find the phrase uh, rule of law in there. Um, I don't think if I'm correct, you'll find the word law in there. Um, I think I'm right in saying you won't find human rights in there. And I think I'm right in saying you won't find the word rights al alone in there. And that's a serious omission, um, especially at a time like this. You know, in the, in the latter part of the 20th century, um, we could sort of take for granted that the world was sort of on the side of liberal democracy, that we were all heading to the same place, but we're not anymore. We're in a world in which Countries are on quite divergent paths where we might be in the phase of history or we're shortly going to be in the phase of history where the world's biggest economy is not a liberal democracy. It doesn't have a fundamental commitment to the rule of law, doesn't have a fundamental commitment to human rights and the notion of an independent judiciary that um, protects those rights. So, um, you know, we need to be on our game and we need to be clearer about what it is we're trying to do in this field. And. Uh, and what our conception of good government is. And it's not just about delivering services efficiently. It's about promoting human rights and making sure that those rights are enforceable. And that's what we're getting at when we're talking about the rule of law. One of the things I think is useful or is important is if we think about that we have towns and cities and counties who are experiencing a whole variety of different kinds of issues. And a lot of what local government, even state and federal government does is being challenged in terms of, well, that's not what they should be doing. Or people are trying to push the letter of the law, as it were, to see what kind of what they can get away with. Thinking of just yesterday, there was a story on the news of a girl who took an AR-15 uh, into a courtroom just because the law said that she was allowed to have open carry. There's extents in which people are kind of seeing what they can get away with. And if nothing else, I think that there is an importance for understanding what the law is just because you have those types of events emerge, which you have to deal with and kind of disarm a little bit. I guess no pun intended on the AR-15 side of that, but still, you have to deal with those situations and still stay within what the law allows you. And if you don't have at least a basic understanding of what the law is, you're certainly going to overstep it. Yeah. And just on that point, I do a lot of work that's got sort of historical perspective on it. And, you know, if you take the long view, you recognize that people in the States and other countries as well are always trying to figure out what they can get away with. Right. And there's always been this struggle about what are the boundaries of, of, of what people are allowed to do and, and how do you manage, how do you maintain legitimacy, but how do you also maintain order? Uh, so that's that's another thing that that sort of broad historical perspective is something that I actually that's another way in which the way I I do my work differs a lot from the what was kind of the standard uh, approach to public policy when I was uh, a student in the in the 80s and probably today, too. So you're coming out of the Kennedy School, you are recognizing deficits in how, you know, argue, arguably a top 
public administration school is teaching public administration. What what is your early work doing to grapple with that? Uh, well, I think I sort of went on, did my own thing, <laughs> which which may have been a career limiting move, but that was, uh, you know, I. So um, a lot of my dissertation was actually, uh, it was sort of classic public administration uh, stuff. It was uh, historically oriented. It had a chunk about um, civil service reform in North America in the progressive era, and that became a short monograph. And then it had a series of articles about, um, uh, a series of articles came out of it that were basically about the evolution of public administration and in the U.S. in the 1930s, um, and then uh, there was a, a bit of, about uh, a lot of what I was doing in the thesis was basically about the evolution of capacities and, and legitimacy, I, I think. Uh, and then there was a bit about the way in which the Kennedy School had been thinking about the the role of senior executives and the problem of legitimacy, and you know the whole notion of the strategic triangle and uh, public value and all that sort of thing. Um, so, uh, and then I got, I, after that, I did a lot of work on transparency for, uh, several years. I sort of, uh, happened into that. I did a lot of work on, uh, public sector reform, uh, that was the heyday of new public management. Um, and then basically over the last 10 years or so, I've been looking into sort of, I'm, I'm trying to find a neat way of explaining what it is I'm doing, but basically high level questions about the evolution of strategies for governing and the the way in which governments sort of shape the overall structure of government in order to meet the priorities of the moment. And that involves taking a, a long view of, of the way government works. So tell me a little bit about your interest in doing historical analysis. Where'd you learn to do it? Why do you like doing it? What, what have you learned from that? Well, I guess um, my point of view is you can't avoid doing it, and um, that if you want to think about grand challenges, as Napa has been calling them lately, you really, you know, you, you have to take a historical approach. One of the things we should actually circle back on is what exactly do we mean when we mean a historical approach, but just sort of hold that thought for the moment. But basically, that the... the I guess my point of view would be to answer the kinds of questions I'm interested in. You have to look back longer than we're used to looking back. And we also have to look forward longer than we're used to looking forward. So basically you have to broaden your temporal horizons, both retrospectively and prospectively. Well, so as prompted, what do we mean when we, t when you say take a historical approach? Um, well, uh, so, Actually, let me circle it back. Let me, let me turn it around on you for you guys. Um, so huh. what do you think a historical approach is? Oi. Here's a question I sort of asked on, on you know, on Twitter a, a while ago. And, um, and, and the question was basically, and I can't remember how I worded it on Twitter, but um, when does history start? That is, um, pick a year. And basically the year and, and, the, and the, the rule is going to be anything that happened before that is history. Anything that happened after that is sort of the realm of current events. So if I asked you, what's the break point for when history starts going you know, backwards, what year would you give? See, I, I wouldn't answer the question. I would say it's, <laughs> it, it's tracing something to its origin to now but it's, it can be, but that could be, you know, three days. Well, another way to put it would be, let's suppose you're, you're a journal editor and you get a paper in and you're a journal editor in, in PA or public policy. Um, and uh, let's suppose it's a, it's a, it's a study of some element of public policy that happened in the, in the 1960s. Would you say that's something that would go to the journal policy history or would it be appropriate to publish in a, is it current affairs or is it basically just a historical matter? See, that's where I start to kind of get weird conf self-conflicting arguments. 
know, I think of it as the idea of, you know, what is an antique? You know, is it a, from a auto perspective, an antique is 25 years old, but everything else kind of says an antique is 50 years old. Applying that same to history, I'm like, well, part of me wants to go, well, you know, the history of the field is maybe 20, 25 years back. But I feel like that also then places stuff from, you know, the 90s on the same way with stuff from the 19-teens or 1920s. And there's a very big difference in terms of how I view one and from a historical context to the other. Yeah. I don't know if I would say 50 years is my cutoff, but I think probably 50 years or maybe longer than some, the person who's been in the field, who's currently in the field, whatever happened before they entered the field. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. We've, we've got a couple of things going on that we should probably distinguish because um, there's two topics we could follow on. One is about the intellectual history of the field. And, you know, what should we know uh, basically about the way in which ideas in public administration or public policy evolved over time. That's the intellectual history. Why did people write the things they did at any particular point in the realm of scholarship or, or practice? But, and then the other thing is just sort of the general question of how much do we draw on history to basically answer interesting questions about public policy or public administration? And and then basically how far back do we go? So, and, and, you know, maybe the kind of Twitter question I asked was, was ill phrased, but when I was a journal editor, I would notice, for example, that if a paper came in and it talked about a case study in the 1980s, um, the reviewers might say, well, you know, fascinating story, but um, that's like uh, ancient history. Um, and, uh, and actually, so when I asked on Twitter, people sort of gave me the break point of like maybe the 90s or maybe about 1990. Um, and, you know, before that, it, it's like another country. It's it's uh, you can do it, but it's sort of like comparative public administration. It's, it's like studying administration in a different country. It's it's sort of regarded as not of primary importance. And that, I think, is that's the sort of thing I'm, I'm, I'm trying to kind of push. Yeah. On. Well, so and we rail against journal editors <laughs> sometimes on here. Heck yeah, journal editors right. suck. Um, them. Except Bruce, of course. Uh, but I mean, I think for just that kind of thing that they're, you know, even like a Kennedy School kind of thing, there is one way to do public administration, contemporary public administration research, and that is this and um this other thing is just different or quirky or fun, but you should do that. Don't do that as your day job. Uh, so like, I think, I think here we sort of very much accept that this is kind of, the history is interesting and history can inform, can inform public administration today. And so feel at home with us, but then let's. You know, and I, so, okay, now this is a radical I mean, I don't know if this is a radical thought or not, but, um, but, you know, I'm actually kind of averse. I'm going to say something and then there will be a predicament that we can't actually deal with what I'm about to say. I'm actually kind of averse to using the word history because once we just stick the, the label history on it, it's like, it's regarded as sort of secondary. It's not regarded as sort of of primary importance. You know, just labeling something as history, it's sort of like labeling it as not quite relevant. And and I guess um, the the thing I would say is that, and, and this sort of ties to another one of my kind of uh, laments about where we are as a field, that uh, we need to be better at talking about big questions of governance, basically um, how the overall architecture of government changes over time in response to new challenges and new priorities. And, you know, you can't do that using a 10 year or a 20 year window. You, you really have to take at least a century and basic to see the way that the overall structure is evolving. Um, it's like the, the governmental apparatus is a creature with a different lifespan than humans. And you can't just use the really truncated time frame of like 15 or 20 years that we tend to use normally when we're looking at the study of public affairs. So, you know, you, you know, 
if you wanted to look at the what the what the really long lived um, animal, if you wanted to study the life of a Galapagos turtle, you know, you have to kind of broaden your view, and that's what we need to do with the state. Well, and so you said, I don't, I don't like the term history as a way to describe work, not necessarily yours or someone else's. So my question is, do you feel that your work has been pushed aside or considered not mainstream because of the term history or is history not an accurate term to describe your work? Yeah. Well, uh, I guess there's a couple points here. Um, the first is that a, a chunk of what I do, a large chunk of what I do, uh, very definitely isn't mainstream. And this now the second aspect of that is, do I feel like the work's been pushed aside? Um, I don't actually uh, think about that question. Um, I sort of decide, you know, I'm I now at the stage of my career where I don't have to worry about. I, I've got through all of the various hurdles of appointment and reappointment, finding a job, getting tenure, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so. Um, I don't have to really make anybody happy anymore. And so um, I, I don't worry a lot about whether my stuff is, how it's regarded. Um, I, I do what I think is important and that does the trick. Um, now, it, it, yeah, a lot of, and a lot of what I do is, does have what people would call a historical bent or, or just to put it a long way, it's got a long temporal horizon. Let's put it that way. Um, it's, it, it looks backwards much further than, uh, a lot of other scholarship does. Well, and I think at one point too, you mentioned evolution, right? Like studying how things change is really interesting and exciting. And so much, I think of what we see today in governance could be traced to somewhere. And so I actually think it's, it's really exciting that someone follows that trail, um, going back. Well, so let's, let's talk about some of your work and the intellectual history of the field. Um, what are some pieces along that time horizon that you think are pretty interesting and that you feel you've been able to bring to light? Actually, you know, there is, if, if I, I can throw in a non sequitur here, uh, I would say one other thing that I do notice that is uh, problematic with regard to the intellectual history of the field. And so, and here what we're doing is talking about our understanding of how ideas were evolving in our field uh, over time. Our approach to intellectual history and public administration is really awful. It, it's, we're not serious about doing intellectual history and we do it badly. Usually, you know, very often we've got this course that everyone has to go through where it's like a forced march through 50 various works in, you know, <laughs> starting with Wilson usually and, and going through all the greats and you read an excerpt from all the different pieces and you have no understanding of the context in which they were writing or what problems they were trying to address or what conversation they're in. That's not intellectual history. So, and and we do that. We we do it badly because I think at root we really don't care that much. So, but so there's two things, two tracks here. Basically, I think, you know, my own view is that we need to be good at answering big questions about the evolution of administrative capabilities, and to do that, we need a long temporal horizon, um, and that involves looking at at history, um, what we would count as history. And then the second thing is as a field, just in terms of our, our own kind of self-awareness about how we got to where we are, we need to do a better job of intellectual history. So that's not just knowing, you know, what Dwight Waldo wrote, but also why he wrote what he wrote. And, and you know, it's similarly with a whole bunch of other authors. Okay, there's things I want to ask. I'm trying to process it all in my head. Now I'm thinking of my own intellectual history class that I had in my PhD program at FSU. And we did kind of a mix uh, where you, know, you spend, you know, of course, you, you read the excerpts of everybody along the way. But I think we spent a little bit more time than I think a lot of 
similar courses elsewhere do, trying to understand the context, understand the linkages of the development of you know how everything kind of happens over time. But that's also put me in a kind of a strange position. So when I go and start talking about anything that happened more than 30, 40 years ago, people sit there and they kind of look at you and they scratch your head and they're like, well, who cares? So, you know, talking about, you know, the Bureau of Municipal Research or the first book, you know, textbook by White in the 1920s, you know, whatever it is, people really, it's important. But I think it's important to a small group of people. And I don't fully understand why it's not more important to everybody else. Uh, well, that's right. And that's sort of what I was getting at earlier on, right? That you go in and you say, I'm going to tell a story about a certain period of time. And then you are immediately sort of fighting, um, fighting the, the assumption that, okay, this not entirely clear, this matters. You know, why do we need to know about this? There is a presumption that you have to rebut that that kind of material is irrelevant to what we're doing today. And that's what I was getting at when I was saying, you know, there's this kind of break point we have in our heads about, well, okay, if you're going to tell me something about what happened uh, 10 years ago, I, I, get, I get why I need to know that. Um, but if you're going to tell me something about something that happened 100 years ago, I, I don't get why I need to know that. So you have to kind of explain it to me. And um, I think, you know, it'd be helpful if we could kind of resist that. You know, like the uh, early 20th century, I mean, the, the period, the progressive era, it, it, there's so much resonance between that era and 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 what's going on uh, right now, both in the U.S. and abroad. Um, you want to understand what's going on in China with regard to rapid urbanization and rapid industrialization and the struggle of a government to basically maintain legitimacy in this period of extraordinary tumult. Well, that's basically what the U.S. government was doing between 1890 and 1920, dealing with rapid industrialization and urbanization, the same kind of, and government basically just trying to get a handle on things. It's the sort of same story. And, you know, but just, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, like to build on that. So my question was going to be, if we all accepted that this approach is really necessary to, to do our work better and to understand contemporary society, like what would the journals be full of? What would we be reading? You'd be probably reading, and so there's a there's a predicament. Um, the the and and I guess you know the the way I would say it is, I mean I guess the way I would pitch it is, it's not that we need to be studying history per se. Uh, it's that one of the things we need to be doing um, is looking more systematically at bigger questions. And once you agree with that proposition then you have to look at what we were describe as history. You have to broaden your temporal horizons because there's no other way to answer the question. Um, and now one of the, and so the journals would uh, be publishing more stuff that um, reads like history, um, you know, reads like stuff we would associate with stuff that's produced in the field of, of history. It would also be incidentally producing more stuff that's basically speculative about the future. I mean, part of so part of our difficulty is our temporal horizon backwards is truncated. Um, part of our difficulty too is that our temporal horizon going forward is truncated. That is, we don't give license to people to speculate about what the future is going to be like. And if you really want to think properly about big questions about where we are and where we're going, you have to give people license to do that, to use their imagination. But just to step back for a sec, one of the difficulties that we encounter is that if I, oh, this happens routinely when I put stuff into journals, you know, the, the question is, um, we have, we have put on these methodological blinkers that now make it very difficult for us to uh, recognize and accept uh, a certain forms of evidence. So if somebody were to produce a piece and send it to a journal using methods that would be familiar in, let's say, the field of history, um, it's, they're going to have a really rough ride in review. 
um, and they'll get comments like, well, this sounds like it's just a story or um, you've told me a story, but I don't see where the evidence is or this just sounds like you're writing about philosophy. Um, and, and we, you know, that, that's un really unfortunate, but basically we have um, deliberately disabled our capacity to weigh certain kinds of evidence. So that's, the, so we've got, so what we've got here is a problem of temporal horizons, the kinds of questions we ask, and our willingness to accept certain kinds of evidence. And, and those three problems are all tied together. So how do you start to kind of solve those problems? Um, or can you? Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, we, this is a self-inflicted wound, right? So it, it's made a little difficult because of the way that the scholarly field has evolved. I mean, it's much more rigid than it used to be 30 uh, years ago. So getting change is tougher, but, you know, part of it is just folks saying, making the case that we need to be better at answering certain kinds of big questions. I mean, and this is one of those moments in history where that's just sort of, I think, really clear. Um, and then you basically say, these are the kinds of questions we, we have to ask. This is how we have to address these questions. And so we're going to have to get over this problem this these methodological blinkers you know take them off and be more willing to accept certain kinds of evidence and so that means the project is basically a making the case this is what we need to do uh and then and then basically saying okay and this is what the implications are for for teaching this is what courses that tie to that vision look like and th these are the implications for research this is what a research program or doctoral training would look like. And so that if that's the sort of pro the overall project, but I would mention that, you know, we've done that kind of process of, of intellectual reconstruction before, because that's basically how the public management movement emerged in the seventies and eighties. You had a group of folks who, who basically said, including folks at the Kennedy school who basically said, we don't want to do public administration anymore. We, have, we think the times require a different way of thinking. And then you had folks like Mark Moore basically la laying out an alternative vision. And then they started building the courses. First, it was the master's courses, and then it was PhD courses, and then it was doctoral programs, and then it was changing the journals. And so that was like a generational project, but it was basically, I would argue, that's the same kind of intellectual renovation we have to do today. Can you talk a little bit, you know, from your research, can you talk a little bit about how the field of public administration has changed over time? Yeah, yeah. Well, I think, and I did a short piece um, for the Minnowbrook, what, what, what number are we on? Minnowbrook 4 or whatever it was, the, the 50th anniversary Minnowbrook conference um, in uh, last year. And, and the piece was called Question the System. Um, and... Uh, and I basically made the point that the field has become more rigid than it was 30 years ago um, in the sense that we have um, a clearer sense. We care more about journal rankings, for example. We have a clearer sense of what the hierarchy of journals is. There's more pressure to get into top ranked journals. Um, the selectivity of these top ranked journals is uh, greater than it used to be. Um, uh, the, the capacity of those journals to basically dictate what counts as good research, reason, to basically dictate what are, the, what are the right questions you can ask and what methods should you use. Th that kind of capa that gatekeeper capacity is strengthened. Um, and this is a problem because it's, uh, it's, sort of means that it's tougher for folks to basically say, you know, I don't necessarily agree with the governing paradigm. I want to try doing something differently. So, um, but again, you know, one of the other things that would be great for this field to be uh, better at is just a sort of understanding of the sociology of knowledge in the field, basically being able to tell um, PhD students, look, this is the world you're going to be in. 
this is the apparatus that's used to generate and and distribute knowledge and these are the incentive structures that are built into it you know and parenthetically here's what the money flow is in the industry as well but basically it's what we would normally call the sociology of knowledge this is the this is the apparatus that you're this is the machine you're going to be spending the rest of your career in and you should know that as you start i i had a student the other day that seemed frustrated with that apparatus right like the why do things work the way they do and you know it it just occurs to me right if i could explain why it is that way maybe it doesn't solve the problem of getting out of it or changing it but at least we come to understand why or we can accept what we're doing i mean even a couple times in here right you said well after i got tenure then i do this and that's i think a way a lot of people are going to figure out how how to have the most fun at work how to do the thing they care about the most how to uh, focus on the things that they think are important um and I, I don't know if that's good or bad. I, I would probably say bad. Uh, but if we know that that is true and we know how to get you to tenure, then we can at least say, here's, here's the time horizon at which you can be you in, and do the work that you care about. Well, and the other aspect of, that's important. And the other aspect of this, too, is just, you know, in the whole business of journal production um, and uh, we, we should have a frank conversation about how that works. But we're we're all too we're all very polite about it. Nobody wants to talk, and a, and a large chunk of this is about money and about money flows, and nobody ever wants to talk about the money. Um, we talk about the virtues of transparency in every other sphere of human activity, but when it comes to our own corner of the world, where we all get all Canadian about it, we f- refuse to talk about it. Do you want to talk at all about how being from Canada impacts your work? I'm interested. <laughs> well, sure. I mean, yeah. I mean, being Can- from Canada does affect my work. Uh, a, you come into it with uh, knowing you're coming from a different regime type, uh, different constitutional structure. So, you know, I go to the Kennedy School and I'm getting all this advice on how senior executives in public service should work. And, you know, right off the top of the bat, I'm thinking, well, that sounds great in, a, in the U.S. system, but a senior executive who took that advice uh, in the Canadian system would have um, a relatively short career. You know, it's so you come in recognizing that different systems um, create different uh, opportunities and constraints on action. So that's part of it. You come in recognizing that uh, the you're dealing with a superpower um, and um, and you also recognize that, you know, the the the, the structure for for the production of knowledge is basically oriented around the superpower. So um, that's something you sort of need to know and something you also need to push back against. Um, You know, one of the things in my career is that uh, I've made a lot of trade-offs between what I think I ought to write about and what I need to write about to get into journals that are dominated by Americans. That's a, and, and lots of international folks deal with that pressure. That's another really serious trade-off that we have to make um you know so i've spent a lot of time writing about american public administration i'm not american so but that to some degree is the price of admission um so that's the predicament as well and then you know the other thing is so my family's british i've got dual british canadian citizenship you i think that sort of feeds into the historical perspective as well um you, you know, when I was growing up, I knew um, that uh, my family was connected with an empire in decline. You know, the, uh, the you knew there was a history there and that you were kind of on the, the downward sl- part of the slope. Um, so that, I think, affects your temporal horizons as well. So there's two questions I want to ask. One, since you did your law degree in Canada and then you were talking about the importance of incorporating some aspect of law into the PA curriculum, how much of that Canadian law background applies back to the States? Is there kind of a set of, I don't know how to phrase it, maybe an undertone of, you know, here's the basic law that applies regardless kind of of where the situation is, or 
I don't really know how to phrase the question, but something kind of long, where does the intersection or how well do the two work together? Yeah. I mean, they work to get together pretty well. The Anglo American, um, or, uh, uh, there's a pretty strong commonality in terms of a, a approach in the, in the common law jurisdictions, uh, U S UK, Australia, New Zealand, um, uh, I, I probably missed a couple of other countries, but the sort of basic orientation to understanding of how law works, uh, constitutionalism, judicial review, administrative law. I mean, you know, there are variants, in, but the basic ideas about how the uh, institutions are supposed to relate to one another and how law regulates governmental action, there's a, a pretty large degree of commonality in there. Okay. The second question I want to ask, I asked that one first, it's the easier of the two. A second ago, you mentioned that one of the challenges of being a international researcher within public administration in the United States is having to kind of direct or gear your research in a certain way to be able to hit the U.S. journals. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, it, it's surprising me to me a, a little bit, not because I, I don't think that it happens, but I think from you know, the U.S. side, we always think about the international community and their challenge of hitting a U.S. journal is being centered around more the English language component, the English, the capacity to write successfully in English, which is most people's not their first language. The language is a is a difficulty. It's not the major difficulty. Um, but even on the that side, when I first started submitting articles to American journals, I got called out on my my writing because I was using non-American I had non-American usages in in the I had British or Canadian expressions or grammatical construction and you know I, I got told by reviewers the article is fine but clean up the language um, and but that you know I think I hope we're past that point but but the other problem is just the basic question of topics I mean you look at my my CV and look at how much stuff I've written that is basically about the United States um, and, you know, you, you do that because that's what journals that are dominated by American scholars, um, prefer if you write, um, it's not as bad as it used to be, but if you write an article about another country, you have to show how it ties to an intellectual agenda that is dominated by American scholars. You have to say, okay, I'm going to write a, a story here about Korea or I tell you a story about Korea or Brazil or France or the uh, uh, or you know some other country, but first let me explain to you how it ties to this intellectual agenda that you have set here in the U.S. And so, even if you've got articles coming from other countries and the language is impeccable, the the other problem is that you know the question that people ha are being asked to address is tied to that agenda that's set here in the U.S. You know, we're not basically saying to scholars in other countries, tell us stories about the priorities in your country. Um, we're saying, you know, tell us a story from your country that informs the discussion that we have decided to have here. And that's sort of a basic problem. I'll admit it's probably my cultural blinders. I've actually never really thought about that before, but, you know, thinking of the international scholars I know, looking at their research, I can definitely see where that, see where that happens. My question is, how do you overcome that? I mean, we could do it on an individual level, but trying to adjust or trying to push more of an acceptance because what happens in other places, even if it's not explicit, everything is this massive network. So we have to be aware of what happens and how things occur in other places. Well, I think it's, you know, it's at a certain point, we, it, it's, we have to make choices. It, it, at the end of the day, academics have to make choices and, and American or, you know, academics are advantaged and it's not just American. It's, it, it's mainly American, but, you know, if you look at the scholarship, it's basically dominated by Americans, um, folks from Britain and a couple of other Commonwealth countries and folks from a couple of other countries and, in in uh northwest europe and you know basically folks who are kind of dominating the system of production right now need to say 
express some curiosity about what's going on in the rest of the world. And it doesn't, and I, by that, I don't mean saying it would be great if we could get someone from India to write about some topic that we happen to be doing a, you know, symposium on in our journal. It means actually asking Indians, what problems are you focused on right now? Tell us, you know, we'll let you set the agenda for a moment and then you tell us what you're thinking about and how we could contribute to that conversation. Um, in the long run, you know, I think this will get a lot of folks from other countries publish in the U S journals because the, the, that that's sort of where the, the economic and political power is at the moment in the very long run that will shift, you know, at a certain point, scholars in Asia, um, in China will, will publish in their own journals because they're simply not worried so much about having the, the imprimatur of an American journal in their work. Huh. Okay. Sorry if I've been too dogmatic in my conversation. No, no. It's, it's given me a lot to, to think about. So I want to switch gears. I'm not going to pretend to count. So tell me how many books have you written? And if you could share with us, like, your process. How, how do you write? write why do you write? Um, do you enjoy it? What tricks work for you? I don't actually have a, a, a straight count. Um, and a couple of the things were like really short, so I don't know if they count as books. The first monograph I did was called So-Called uh, Experts. Um, it was about civil service reform in the early 20th century. And, uh, and when the press mailed me the, the book, I happened to be in another country. So they had to declare on customs, on the custom slip, what was in the package. <clears throat> And what they wrote on it was so-called book. And uh, my wife thought that was very entertaining. So, but that's a very short one. I don't, <laughs> I don't know if I count that as a, uh, as a book or not, because it was pretty brief, but uh, several. So, um, and, uh, and I started get writing books seriously after about 2006. Um, and, um, you know, not coincidentally, I was sort of over the tenure and promotion um, uh, most of that, that process by then. So I had more flexibility. Um, and, uh, basically, uh, what I do is I find a question that I think is going to be interesting. I sort of, uh, spend a lot of time thinking about how I would structure, um, a conversation about that, you know, mechanically speaking, a book is about 80,000 words. It's about six or seven chapters. Um, you're going to have a setup chapter at the front, concluding chapter at the end. You're going to have five in the middle. So you've got to basically figure out what your big question is and how you proceed through all the various parts of an argument. What aspects do you want to explore? And then you've basically got, so, um, you know, uh, six or seven chunks of maybe 10,000 words each. That's, you know, so you, 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 the, the key thing is you, you basically take the big project and you break it down into manageable parts. That's the, that's the, the key way to, to move ahead. And when you're writing a book, would you say that you have work-life balance or do you give it your all? I, it's, uh, it's a production process. So it's, you, you're, I mean, by the way, I mean, the process I just described for doing the book, it's basically the same as a journal article, right? I mean, it's a journal article has a start, has a finish. It's got N, you know, fixed number of middle components. So you're basically, it's like an accordion. You're just kind of, the journal article is an accordion compressed. The book is a journal ar article with the accordion expanded, but it's structurally the same. And then you basically, it's just a production process, you know, uh, 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 you're, you're going to do a certain amount of production in a certain period of time, uh, bang out a chapter, you know, depending on what other stuff you've got going on in a certain period of time. And, and then by the end of it, you've got a book. What's the next book? Uh, the next book is uh, under contract with uh, Polity Books. And it's... Um, uh, I knew you'd have one. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it's called, uh, at the moment, it's called, uh, 
I think it's called Super States Empires of the 21st Century. So the, uh, the setup is that uh, we are uh, coming out of an era in which we thought uh, at the end of the 20th century that states were irrelevant, that the world was breaking up into a very large number of small states, that you know there were 190 odd uh, states by the end of the 20th century. Um, most of them have uh, fewer people than Switzerland and less territory than New Zealand. Um, so, uh, and lots of people were saying we were at the, the end of the era of nation states. And the premise of this book is that, um, in fact, it's going exactly the other way. Um, we're in the age of what I'll call super states. So like polities like uh, India, which by 2050 will be the most populous country in the world. It'll have, I think, 1.7 billion people. China will be the second most populous by then with about 1.5 billion, if my recollection's right. European Union, which I'm going to count as an as an aspiring super state has about half a billion and the US has about 400 million, we'll have about 400 million. So about 40% of the world's population is gonna live in just those four polities. And then, the, and then the question is, why would we think it's reasonable to, uh, uh, wh why is it a reasonable thing to believe that you could govern a polity that large well? And, you know, we basically have little or no experience in actually governing at that scale. Uh, each of India and China will, will have more people than the total world population in the late 19th century. So, um, so the premise is that uh, there are distinctive problems of governance that, that come when you're trying to do it at extraordinarily large scale. Um, and so I want to do probe that question and the thing I'm playing with right now, and I'm still trying to figure out the structure of the book, is basically to say, you know, um, the analogy here might not between be between conventional states. The analogy might actually be with empires, which were the dominant form of political organization until about the 1920s. And these were like really large, populous, diverse entities, and nobody thought you could... Con forge these entities into nations, like distinct peoples. Um, you just sort of took diversity and, and, and expanse for granted and then figured out how to govern that way. And so the premise would be that you've got, and I apologize for going on at length, but you've got four polities that are basically dealing with the question of how you govern at scale in very different ways. China, India, EU, and US have four different strategies for governing at scale. And the question is, who's got it right? So that's the sort of thing I'm kicking around right now. Keep kicking. It sounds great. Yeah, it should be fun. You, I really, uh, this conversation, and I've never met you, so great to meet you, Al. <laughs> you do really seem to think about this work in a different way. Uh, and I think a lot of... PhD students who we really think are an audience for the podcast also want to build a career thinking about things in different ways. And so we've mentioned a couple of times that, well, you didn't agree here, you didn't agree there. It's been a challenge to get something in a journal, but how, how do you motivate yourself to think differently and, and continue to? Well, um, I think, you know, um, I've been sort of thinking so I've been, I've already always had sort of certain tendencies in my research. And one of the things that I'm doing recently is trying to explain to myself what it is I've been trying to do. So the last book I did uh, from Cornell University Press called Strategies for Governing, which came out uh, in December, is me, I mean, I'm talking to the field, but I'm also basically talking to myself to try and figure out what it, what's the project that I'm trying to pursue. And I think I would make the argument that at the end of the day, what most of us are doing is really trying to explain to ourselves what we think is going on at the world, in the world. Um, and, uh, you know, so, but there, and the predicament that everybody has to confront is sort of the problem of managing 
in, if you're simpatico with the way the, f- the field um, is presently structured and its priorities and methods, you're in a, I suppose you're in a great place. Um, but if you're not, then you sort of have to manage the tension between you think the way you think stuff should be done and the um, incentive structures that are posed by the institutional apparatus in the field. And the predicament is that institutional apparatus is becoming more rigid, uh, has become, I think, more rigid over the past 25 or 30 years. And you then you're basically, you know, you're, you're engaged in a calculation about when do you push and when do you accommodate? When do you do the kind of stuff you need to do to get a job, to uh, get tenure, to get promoted to full, to get published in journals, you know, sort of, and when do you kind of push the envelope to basically do the kind of stuff that you think uh, needs to get done? Um, and, and I think the important thing is for folks to recognize that that tension may be there and it has to be, you know, it has to be managed. You sort of have to be deliberate and conscious and conscious in recognizing that there may be a gap between what you want to do and what the world is demanding of you. And you basically have to manage that tension. 